Hi, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of The Pod With, the podcast where artists discuss their expertise in different areas, either in the music industry or causes they are passionate about. My guest today is Mike Rivkis, whom you may recognize as the new singer of the Ramjacks. Now, if you've been following my interviews with Unraveled, you may have seen the very interesting chat that we had back in March when the Ramjacks released their new album, Hestia, which is an absolute banger. And if you haven't checked it out already, you probably should go and do that now. But other than a very talented songwriter and self-taught multi-instrumentalist, Mike is also a filmmaker who has experience both in direct music videos making vlogs for his touring bands and also in the commercial world. In our talk, we discuss the connection between music and sound and he walks us through his creative process. Enjoy. Thank you for joining me again. Uh, I think that every meeting we've had has had some sort of te technical problems, but I'm positive that we will work them out. Absolutely. I'm, I'm calling it right now. My internet's going to go in at some point, go in and out at some point during this interview. So it is what it is. I'm sorry, because I know it's I know it's not gonna. At least we tried. I know. At least I made it this time. <laughs> it's okay. I wouldn't hold it against you anyway. Yeah, the other day we had the music video last minute because with the rest of the okay, well, I'll just keep talking to see if it goes in and out. Yeah. With the um with the last leg of the tour getting canceled, the German tour, um we had to scramble to get home in time to make sure we weren't going to get stranded in countries. because that's always a possibility. And then we still have, we still had to shoot one music video before we all went back because the next time we get together is in the end of January in the UK and that's for a tour and we're not going to have time to do a music video before that song comes out. So we had to do it extremely last minute so i was like all right we have today to do the music video and that's it um so is it from the upcoming ep it is it's off uh the brass for gold it's going to be the uh, first track on the ep bounding main and yeah we got pretty lucky we went to this shipyard to shoot because i was like for a low budget music video where it has to be quick and fast you can't have a whole elaborate story and everything you just have to pick a location and do a performance video and just edit it in a cool way. Awesome. That was what we did. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, this, uh, we were in the shipyard and this guy just let us use his boat. So we got pretty lucky. Awesome. So uh, let's try to start the interview. Yeah. I'd like to start from the very beginning. How did you get involved with music in the first place? Um, by being bad at sports. <laughs> so it's one so way or the, the other. States. Yeah. In the States. No, I don't know. Uh, um, I don't know. I was about 14 and just said, I was obsessed with, um, I got obsessed with three bands through, you know, I was skateboarding. So I was at the skate park and the older kids were listening to like the misfits and the bouncing souls and rancid and no effects. And I was like, Oh wait, this is cool. This was in the age of uh, really sketchy internet downloads. So I just searched punk music and then whatever stuff came up that was obviously titled incorrectly and from the wrong bands and stuff. I just downloaded a million songs. That was how we got started in listening to music. And then for some reason, I think these metalheads in my class who I did not get along with, they were like starting a band and they kept like bragging about it. And I was like, all right, I'll start a band and beat you guys in the talent show. How about that? And they were like, yeah, yeah, let's see. And so I got a bass. I had like, <clears throat> I think I had like $110 saved up, which was like the most money I'd ever had in my life. And I, it was like a life savings for a 14 year old. And I bought a really cheap bass guitar and then got my friend Lindsay. Uh, she was playing guitar. And then these two uh, Korean brothers, the Park brothers, And we formed a band and we played Blitzkrieg Bop and we beat the metal band. And uh, that was how we got started. <laughs> they awesome. were pissed too. They did, they, first of all, they did, I believe it, a thing called love, which is not in the range for a 14 year old kid. <laughs> and that was their downfall. 
Uh, and you are self-taught for the most part, aren't you? Wait, sorry, what was that? You are self-taught for the most part. Completely self-taught, yeah. Never taken a lesson. That's amazing. And how many instruments do you play? I mean... <laughs> Starting I with those that you played. Hmm? Sorry. Well, what I played on the Hestia album, I played um, banjo, accordion, tin whistle, vocals, acoustic guitar. But then I, and I did a lot of the electric guitars also. Um, but I also play drums, trombone, mandolin. Um, I don't know. But I, I, I just bullshit. I just bullshit instruments. I can't actually play any of them well. You know what I mean? It's like, cool, can I play that riff for recording? Got it. So that's all. I mean, Bare minimal. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Because you know what you have to know. Same thing with languages, I think. You can be conversational, but you don't have to read philosophy in German. Exactly. If I can go to Greece and say, Faithela Afto, then mm. I, I can order food anywhere yes. and give them an Afkali stall and then I'm out the door, you know? <laughs> and uh, as I was telling you when you were over, even the few days that you spoke Greek really did improve uh, your accent and the way you sounded. So I guess practice makes perfect in everything, right? After 10 days in Greece and I start, okay, wait. Am I back? Yes. Um, I like to imitate. Okay. So I like to imitate. So after 10 days in Greece, I start really hearing the fine nuance, uh, nu mm -hmm. nuances of the accent. Yeah. Um, so by the time I saw you in Athens, I was able to like almost imitate the way people talk. Uh, what sparked your interest in image and how and when did you start combining the two? An image? Well, yes. Um, it was mostly just trying to find a career because music doesn't pay the bills, you know, and music was always a passion. And I always said like, okay, what's the ideal day of work for me? I want it to be fun. I want it to be active. Um, and I just imagine just being on a film set kind of like, I don't know, just being involved on a film set. So I knew I wanted to get involved in some form of film in any capacity and through a long story, got a job, an entry-level job as a video editor editing wedding films. And that was where I really started to like editing, putting the story together. And then I also love the technical side of it, um, you know, learning the software and all stuff like that. Um, so starting as an editor, I then started to notice like, oh, you know what? This sequence would better if we had this shot, that type of stuff. So then when I started shooting, I already knew, you know, what series of shots make a good sequence together. And then, and yeah, that was, so I got started through editing. And as you mentioned, you also direct. So uh, mm -hmm. in this form of controlling all the powers, quote unquote, uh, are you more confident that you will be able to further progress or is it uh, the cheaper DIY way to do uh, music videos, for instance? Um, well, at, on one side of it, <clears throat> it's that you have, you have music as like the full art form that the band is doing. Add video, that's a completely different element that left up to somebody else I don't always trust how it's going to match with our music. So since I have the capacity, you know, to make a, as a director, to make, you know, some form of video come to life, since it's coming from the same brain, I want it all to be one cohesive piece of, I'm not going to say the word art because I hate that, but, you know, one piece of creation, whatever. It all, oh God, I hate talking about that stuff. <laughs> I won't call it art. Why not? I don't know. I feel like a douchebag. <laughs> well, technically, it is a form of art. You create, yeah. you have a thought, and then it develops until it actually starts taking uh, shape, and you yeah, interpret yeah. it through different mediums. So, yeah, and like the most cohesive example of that would be our or a Sainted Millions music video, mm -hmm. since it's a song, um, it's a song 
between the living and the dead singing back and forth verses and choruses to each other. Um, so the music video takes place in day one of the afterlife. Um, so I don't know. It, it, it was just kind of fun to make. It's kind of campy, but it was a fun um, piece of put together to have one cohesive story to be told mm. uh, I, I have a question that might sound a little stupid so please forgive my ignorance that's fine there are no stupid questions just stupid answers or some i think it's the other <laughs> way around but whatever go on <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the difference between a videographer and a filmmaker videographer is just kind of like film events they put a tripod down they sit in the back of the room and they just film the conference or like it's an old school wedding thing where it's like okay film the wedding and but a filmmaker actually tells a story with cinematography and editing videographer is more so like an just documentarian i hate when people call me a videographer <laughs> it's i know it's like a it's not a big deal but it's just one of those pet peeves of mine when like When I was working for a, a running shoe brand, like a company, and I'm putting together these beautiful um, advertisements shot in like scenic locations, the salt flats in Utah. And then like, this is our videographer, Mike. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I filmed the meetings. You know, like, yeah. But also like that's, that's just, I think that's something that only filmmakers think about. Fair enough. Uh Can we draw a comparison here? Like you have directed ads and uh, technically a brand is trying to sell a product uh, based on uh, the viewer's emotion and values. How is that different from what a band is doing through a music video where they try to sell a single and then the album? Um, so the way that I treat ads and music videos is I'm just trying to capture a general, let's call it a vibe, a general vibe or feeling or emotion. Um, so to me, they're the same. Um, I don't get too caught up in the like, Oh, this is corporate. I'm selling a product. Like, I don't know. I've never really thought of it that way. Um, whereas like with some of like my sh running shoe commercials, um, For an example, we did a we did a series where we interviewed runners, and there was this one girl who was an immigrant from Ethiopia, and she moved to the states when she, you know, her English wasn't very good, and she was like a young teenager, and she started running, and she of course was like an unbelievable athlete. So through track and field, she started to make friends. She went from being this like kind of unsure of herself, like young girl who couldn't speak English in a new environment to being like the star athlete of the school. Um, and I don't know. So that was really cool to me. So to be able to like, I don't know, for her just to tell her story and then get footage of her and put together this little documentary cut. Um, that to me was, was, you know, telling an entire story that I wasn't thinking about it in terms of like selling a product. Your songs are inspired by the places that you meet, the places that you visit, sorry, and the people that you meet. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it the same way when you come up with a story for a video, a music video? Or is it something that know. should um, fit uh, what the song is about? Yeah, so yeah, my videos aren't mostly inspired by places. Um, for music videos, they're mostly just okay, what does this song sound like it looks like to me? So it's like, I hear it and I'm like, okay, this obvious, this one sounds like it's, I don't know, like nautical. It sounds like it's going to be on the docks because we have accordion and banjo and it has the sea shanty vibe for some of them, you know, <laughs> of course, especially in the Celtic, um, you know, in the Celtic genre. So for some of those songs, I hear, you hear it and you just go like, all right, this sounds like a foggy day on the ocean. And so I'm like, how do we do a music video that, encapsulates that and that's kind of the way I think about it mm -hmm. with uh, the Ramjax you started doing some road videos which you are not a stranger to mm -hmm. obviously because you also did that with uh, Mickey Rich Show uh, did you start doing it so that you wouldn't lose your mojo or because it's something that kept you focused during a long tour uh, um, <clears throat> you know I 
social media itself is the blessing and a curse. Um, the way that this band relies on it, not, I wouldn't say relies on it, but it, it helps the band for sure. Yeah. It's like this, yeah, it's like a beautiful idea to be like, no, nah, don't even worry about it, Dad, and just do your music. And like, of course that's important, but if you want to be advancing in this field, you have to be on the social media game. So part of me starting a YouTube channel to talk about music and talk about touring is me saying like, all right, do I want to future proof my career as a musician? Then I have to get started on this stuff. Um, so I'm at least trying um, to start a YouTube channel. Also with the hopes of inspiring young kids, not, not inspiring, but showing young kids what the road is like once you actually start playing music for a career and saying like, no, it's not all glamorous. You can't just put out a few hits on SoundCloud and blow up and then you're doing stadiums. Like, no, you're going to be busting your ass a lot. Um, most of it, you know, isn't, isn't all glamorous. But at the same time, that should get kids stoked on playing music, just seeing someone doing it on the very personal level. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the hope. You know? <laughs> uh, what advice do you have uh, for people who are now starting out in the post-pandemic era? Almost post-pandemic era. In, uh, yeah, I would say, well, advice on starting out, get learn your instrument learn songwriting that comes first um if you you can you can look as good as you want on the socials you can have like weird little things blow up on tiktok and instagram and youtube but if you're not actually good at songwriting then none of that stuff will stick around you know it's mm -hmm. you'll have you'll be like it's it's like an even more with the viral world it's a it's a more short-term version of the one hit wonder whereas you'll have like a hundred thousand view video and then you're back to doing nothing. So if you're, if your songs aren't stuff that people want to listen to, then you're going to have trouble, you know, sticking around. That uh, actually makes a lot of sense. And how about uh, using social media to promote themselves? Because the round uh, for instance, is an established band, but someone who's now starting out, How could they mm -hmm. use it to uh, network and uh, build an audience? How should they use image to do that? So in the same way that having a scene helps bands, helps musicians, it's just having a giant group of people that all work together to get to know each other's music. I think treating social media like that is the best way you can do it. Um, it's easy when you're, posting photos of yourself and stuff you're doing like relevant to your band and your music, it's easy for it to feel like me content. Like, okay, I put this up. Hopefully people like me, blah, blah, blah. And like, that's not the way to think about it. You have to think like, can I build a community by becoming friends with other artists? So I think like for someone starting out, you should be interacting with other artists in your genre that are all doing the same thing. Um, and just using that to build an online community as if, you were bands showing up to play shows at the same place every weekend. Going back to uh, creating videos uh, for you, I guess you're a perfectionist, right? No, I have the saying no. done is better than perfect. <laughs> uh, yep. When do you know, uh, hmm? was that? I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. Uh, when do you know that you have created your own style and that you have assimilated all your influences? Um, yeah. So when did I find out I had my own style? Um, I don't know what, if I have one or what it is, but just the same way that, you know, anyone who learns guitar a few years down the road is going to sound like them playing guitar rather than their teacher teaching them. Mm. And with filmmaking, since there are so many infinite variables that go into it, even as how you expose your shots, how you color them, which frame rates you use, stuff like that. Um, there's so many little details that go into how you shoot that you're inevitably going to have your own style. And since I don't really think about, does it look like I made it? I, I don't really know what that is yet. But, you know, you watch my videos, my, the music videos I've directed back to back and like, yeah, they kind of start to look similar, oddly enough. 
when you're working with a new client, do you try to approach more what they have in mind or bring it into your own world? Um, a little bit of both. So there are certain clients that their own very distinct brand guidelines and I stick to that and mm -hmm. I have to be a yes man. I just want to make them happy. They're in the door, out the door, get paid. I'm not trying to be an artist or a, a visionary hero or anything like that. It's like, no, we're doing dog food commercials. One look pretty. They want the dogs to be happy and eating. Get it out the door. Cool. Yeah. That's easy. Um, and then there are other clients that when they say like, okay, what would you do? And that's when I will do completely in my own vision and then send it to them and say, okay, what are you thinking? Does this match with how you're seeing it? And then usually we'll meet in the middle. So, and when you're working with, when someone, when, when someone is paying you, um, I mean, obviously it depends on the project and client, but when someone's paying you, it's their decision, what it looks like, you know, you have your, your input, you can't get personally affected that, you know, they wanted it colored differently. Um, they're paying you. This is not you creating your art for the world to see like, no, you're, this is your job. Like what is your creative process like? from the second you conceive an idea to the moment when you export the video? Um, it's usually a coffee-fueled burst of creativity where I'm like, oh, this would be awesome. And I get stoked on the idea. Then I write down all the ideas around it. And then I will procrastinate and then there will be a thing on my to-do list that will say like, write out, write out, you know, treatment for blah, 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 music video. And I will do a million things before I do that until, until it's really coming down to it. And they're like, Hey, so what are we doing for the music video? We, you know, we have to start like organizing it. And then at the last minute I will sit down and go, okay. And then drink coffee again and go, all right, maybe this will be cool and just start typing. So it's first of energy, a lot of uh, procrastination and then last minute messing around. I can relate so badly. I'm the exact same way. And I will yeah. put doing something off like until the very last minute because I know I'll be able to do it in the end. I just need to, you know, be under some sort of stress and chasing yep. a deadline to know that I'm going to sit down and work on that exclusively. Yeah, for sure. It's tough. It's tough because I'm a bad worker. You know, like I procrastinate, especially being in a band for a job. I don't have deadlines, you know? So, well, I do, for music videos and stuff like that, I have deadlines, but it's even worse when I have clients that I'm editing for doing animations and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I finish it all. I'll finish the project in the van because I work in the van a lot. And then I get to the hotel and I can't upload the project because it's a whole gig and a half of photo of animations and the Wi-Fi doesn't work. And that's usually the case. And how do you work around that? It's a problem. I bring my computer with a backpack to every cafe or restaurant in the area. Um, even where were we? We were in. Vienna and the Wi-Fi in the apartment didn't work. So or, wait, can you hear me? It says yes. Okay. Earlier in the day, um, I was at a cafe. I was, at, I think I was getting breakfast and I was like, Oh my God, the internet here works. I use a speed test app on my phone because I have to know where the internet works in that city. The client needed these animations like pretty soon. I couldn't upload them in the apartment. So at like 1 AM, I bundled up. It was freezing. I think it was snowing. I walked to that cafe and sat outside of it with my computer holding it like this, got on their Wi-Fi and uploaded. Oh my God. And, and you just have to, if you want to be able to make money while on the road, you've got to do stuff like that. I mean, that's determination. That's the whole uh, digital nomad stuff they don't tell you about when they're <laughs> talking about how great their life is in YouTube videos and their fucking morning routines. <laughs> Well, that's an idea for another YouTube video. That's not a bad idea. Uh, I'm a digital nomad. I've never <laughs> said it, but 
Uh, well, technically, technically. Uh, anyway, I want to ask in photography, we have uh, very often conversations about uh, how good your equipment needs to be in order for you to take good pictures. Is it the same thing in uh, filmmaking? Or is it a portion of having a decent equipment and knowing what to do with it? Yeah, it's it's knowing what to do with it. It's knowing what equipment to get. Like, I would always value getting nice lenses over a new body. Although in filmmaking, the new advancements, um, moving from 8-bit color to 10-bit color with a lot of the cameras makes a huge difference. But more than that, like, get good at using your equipment. But post-production is where you really need to get good because... I've seen photographers at our shows, they're shooting on like a 1DX Mark III with like really nice Canon glass. And, and I notice it when I'm singing and I'm like, I'm looking, I'm like, yeah, 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 these photos are gonna be dope. And then I get them and they have the fucking clarity punched up all the way. They have the colors overly saturated. The fucking, the yellows are like shifted to green with that ugly green tint. The skins have like magenta, like purple mix it like, and I'm just like, no. No. And you almost want to ask the photographer, hey, can I have the raws, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I can edit these, <laughs> which is so insulting. I would never do that. But you did think about it. <laughs> people. Oh, I've had the thought a million times. Just they show photographers around 2006 to 12 for some reason. You were like a good photographer if you could just slide up the clarity thing and bring the shadows up to create that weird fake HDR look. And that for some reason was a trend and some people still do that. And I don't know why. <laughs> Makes skin tones look horrible. Brings out shadows that aren't even there. Yeah, I think that's a thing with uh, hardcore photography now. Yes, yeah, it's a very prominent trend. <laughs> yeah, it looks horrible. Stop. <laughs> oh God. Uh, when you are creating, is it more of an expression of your uh, inner needs or a form of escapism? Mm, I think it's clinging on to the fact that we are so temporary so if you can just document everything before you leave the earth that's all you can do to leave your mark because we spin around the earth like 80 times and then we're done okay this is turning a little uh heavy and dark that's not really I'm sorry that's not the answer i was expecting not gonna lie <laughs> Listen, I went to Auschwitz earlier last week. Oh, right. I've been in a dark, I've been in a dark mood. Uh, how was the visit? Um, it was really good. I feel more connected to what happened than I ever have. And I watch documentaries. I listen to survivor stories and all the time. I'm really interested in it. Um, and after going there, it felt like it happened yesterday. It was really a completely changing experience. Yeah, I think it's important that people see it and connect with it. Okay, to start wrapping things up, uh, how did the pandemic affect your work? Um, since I had joined the Rumjacks at the very beginning of the pandemic and I knew that we had to write an album, um, I was finishing up video projects. So I started to have free time. So it was really like, all right, I need to spend the next few months um, writing this album. So it affected my work that it gave me time to really, I guess, research by listening to all the old music, figuring out what made, what makes their sound sound like them. And how is my writing going to affect that? And how do I mix the two? Um, so I don't know, it gave me a lot of time to actually focus on not just writing songs, but like 
beneath that what goes into making their music what it is. Probably, you know. Do you ever get a fear of getting burnout? Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, there are, I think it's important to take breaks. Um, like I haven't written anything since the summer. Um, if I was writing all the time, yeah, I would, I for sure would burn out. So I'll like, unless like a song idea really just comes to my head and I write it down or sing it into my phone. Um, I haven't been focusing on writing at all, but I know this month that I'm going to be home. Um, I plan on just, it's going to be snowy. It's going to be in Boston. I'm not going to want to go out. So I'm just going to be in my studio in the basement of the North end of Boston. Um, just slamming coffee and Adderall and <laughs> recording and writing demos. Okay. Well, I think we are done for today. Thanks again for taking the time to do this. Enjoy your yeah, time thank off. You. And hopefully we'll see you next year somewhere on the road. <laughs>